I'm Daniel Demise, and today we embark on a fascinating journey into the extraordinary mind of David Gladstone, a visionary who masterfully balances the roles of a photographer, philosopher, astronomer, writer, and journalist. His life has been nothing short of eclectic. From his early days, David found himself in remarkable encounters with legends like Jimi Hendrix, Jerry Garcia, and Bob Marley. And over the years, he's built lasting friendships with notable figures like Jack Sarfati and Russell Targ from the CIA's Paranormal Desk. Throughout his journey, David fearlessly delved into intellectual culture, time travel, and the paranormal, subject to the challenge conventional beliefs. Yet he remains a beacon of authenticity and open-mindedness, seamlessly merging the heart of an artist with the mind of a critical thinker. His experiences may seem otherworldly and unnerving to the uninitiated, but they carry profound insights for those willing to listen. David Gladstone could very well represent the voice of the future, a reflection of what awaits us after our own adventures through the realms of the impossible. Join us as we explore the brilliance of David Gladstone, an icon of the 20th century who has recently authored the incredible book, The Great Race, Physics, Paranormal, Time Travel, UFOs. Throughout his journey from San Francisco to various places around the US and now calling Norway home, David has witnessed and been part of some of the most remarkable events of his time. So without further ado, let's dive into the greatness that is David Gladstone. So, so you were trained as a journalist in at American University, and then you yeah. graduated at San Francisco State in astronomy, or you minored in astronomy. Um, but you're also a philosopher, a writer, and a photographer. Um, yeah. And so, you know, just help me understand how it was, and you grew up in San Francisco, right? No, I grew up in uh, Connecticut. And okay. I grew up in Connecticut and then I went to Woodstock. Okay. And it was in Woodstock where I met all these people and I ended up flying on a, on a private plane to New Mexico. And then I hitchhiked to California and I made it to San Francisco and, um, and How did you get on a plane? got me attracted to San Francisco. Well, I met, uh, I met Paul Kantner and Jerry Garcia and Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. So I, I wanted to come to California. You, you and, met and, Jimi Hendrix? Yeah, I met Jimi Hendrix. I have a picture of myself with him. That's good. And, and so I also, you I also met, uh, I also met, uh, who's the guy who wrote Liberation Song? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm going to have to. You learn. know, the reggae music? <laughs> you know that song, the, the Harder, you know that movie, The Harder They Come? Um, I think I've watched it before. Don't yeah. have the memory of it, but yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I met all those guys. And what was his name? Marley, Bob Marley. Oh, Marley. Was Marley the one for a liberation song? Yeah. Look, you learn something new every day. That's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Liberation oh, song. Um, and you know, like, uh, you know, uh, shanty town, you know, Demi Lou, Demi Demi Whale, shanty town. That was, uh, uh, what's his name? Little, uh, oh, that guy was a great writer. And were you, were you into reggae back uh, when? In, well, when I, went to, I got to work this concert in Washington where my best friend, the one, one who I write about in the book, um, he was working, he called me and asked me to work it. And I, we smoked a joint backstage with all those guys. Uh, it, it was incredible. Of course, I love, I, that's such a great album. The Harder They Come. I love all those songs. Yes, I, I do. And, I do love it. No okay, question. So, so you grew up in Connecticut and then you moved. At 17, to... I, I went to Woodstock and I, I hitchhiked. I started hitchhiking across the country and. I I got to California. So by 19, uh, in 1972, I lived in, in Berkeley for a while. 
And then I moved up to Oregon and went to school at Mount Angel College. And then soon after I went back to California and I lived there and I've been living there ever since. So I've lived now in San Francisco for since the, since like the late seventies, like 70, 70, in 1977, I went to UC Davis and studied viticulture. I worked in New York also, you know, I did a lot of things. So I've traveled wow. around. But unfortunately, you departed nine months ago, right? And, <laughs> and then, then I went, I left San Francisco and I came back to Norway where I had been before. Okay. Um, I'm to work on this book. It's called uh, The Great Race, Physics, Paranormal, Time Travel, UFOs. And that's what I've been doing for the last nine months. It's It's been almost nine months to the day. Yeah, now. And, and so and you spent 40 years in San Francisco, is that right? I spent uh, more than 40 years in San Francisco. More like, um, well, if I left last year from 20... To, um, I left in uh, I left in twenty twenty two in October, and I had yeah. been there for the for for most of the last since the seventies. So oh, wow. you know, I'd been there for forty five or forty seven years, something like that. And so you you've seen a lot of sort of modern San Francisco emerge um, and you've sort of been embedded in that history over time, right? Over time, you know, the, the best part of it was in the 70s and the 80s. Now it's right. become a shithole. So I, <laughs> I left. But everyone says crime is up. It's terrible. Uh, it's unbelievable. I'm a photographer. So I spent my life there. You know, I did a lot of photography and you know, worked in the wine business and I got to meet Jack Sarfati. He moved into my apartment. So I met these people like Gary Zukov and, you know, uh, Fritjof Capra and all the people from the Future Phys Physics Group. Have you read that book, How the Hi Hippies Saved Physics? How the Hippies Saved Physics? I've read parts of it, but I know that they were part of the, um, the and, and this is Jack Sarfati's Physics and the, Something phys. I mean, isn't this the um? This is a book by David Kaiser from MIT. Oh no, I've, I've read the Kaiser book, How the Hippies yeah. Say Physics. Yeah, so I've yeah. read that, and it's a, it's a good book, and it gives you a lot of the background. Uh, you know, uh, um, you know, but it he published that book in 2012, which was right before metamaterials became a big deal and jack has altered his science completely since since the 70s now he's doing he's doing the best science of his life at 83 it's pretty amazing and uh, so he's got a crew of top-notch physicists who are working with him and they're working on a new paper and uh he's going to have a seminar from cortona italy in October yeah. and you know so there'll be a lot of stuff going on with that yeah yeah you no know, trying to create the warp drive right which is I mean there, there's something about this whole sort of um I mean we can get there but just 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 to dig into you as an individual a little bit how did you get into photography because that's just I find that you you've, you've lived some of the collect my my first serious picture I took at the fans in Boston. I really I really wanted to be a photographer and I went to Woodstock and my parents got me a camera but I was afraid that I would lose it or get it stolen so I didn't bring it. And of course if you ever saw that movie Almost Famous? No I haven't. I will now. Watch that movie. I met everybody in the rock and roll world at, in Woodstock. And if I had had a camera, you would you would know me from having been on Rolling Stone magazine for 50 years and taking all those pictures. I mean, 
and so I didn't bring the camera and, and, you know, but so I started shooting when I went to Boston and, um, I how did you end up meeting all these people? What, what, what was, how did you end up meeting all these people? What was like the well, whole. Well, I went to Woodstock and, and I went there early and, um, I volunteered to help build it because there was nothing made. We was just, there was nothing there. It was just a farm. And we had to dig trenches and to create a stage. I mean, there was nothing there. There was literally nothing there. So uh, one of the jobs that I did was would pick up, picking up the bands from the, uh, I had a tractor with a, an attachment where people could sit in. So I picked up the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane. And I ended up knowing those guys for the rest of my life. Jerry Garcia and, you know, Grace Slick. And, you know, so I know her son, uh, her daughter, China, and uh, Paul's daughter as well. Paul and I were were great friends. We um, we became neighbors and spent a lot of time at the cafe. Jack knew him too. And Jerry Garcia spent a lot of time at uh, in North Beach. Mick Jagger did too. All those people came to North Beach and, you know, would go to the restaurants we frequented and stuff like that that's where they'd hang out so okay so you guys had like a, a spot that everyone sort of went to yeah everybody came everybody came to uh, north beach it was a it was a real hangout spot for because famous people could come there and nobody would bother them they would just ignore them so it was yeah. okay for a guy like mick jagger they'd come in and eat eat dinner at this place that i used to go to that's when he, you know, this is this was back in the you know in the seventies. That's fascinating. So, That's very fascinating. But when it only cost eight bucks to eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now it's now it's it's now it's, it's two hundred bucks. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's probably worse in Norway. Uh, probably more expensive in Norway. I mean, it's, it's probably very not as expensive here, but you know, it's about the same in San Francisco. I. Yeah, I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and he told me about a restaurant that he went to lunch with his daughter at, called Bouchon in Napa. It's two fifty for lunch with with a glass, you know, with a couple glasses of wine. I mean, you know, that's that's yeah, it's really expensive. Um, yeah, that's remarkable, and so so interesting. So you went to Woodstock. You ended up meeting all these really interesting people. And yes. then and then sort of how did you get embedded in this scientific culture? This sort of group of individuals that Jack Sarfati lives within. Right. Before, okay, when I got to the Cafe Trieste, one of the first people I met was a guy named Kim Burifato. And Kim worked at the bar across the street, which is the oldest bar in San Francisco called the Saloon. Okay. Okay. The Saloon was built in 1865. It's just a little dump. It's, it's not even, it's about the size of this room I'm sitting in now. Yeah. Um, and uh, Kim told me about this guy. I, I told him I, I, you know, I had broken up with my girlfriend and, I needed to rent out my room. And he goes, my friend Jack needs a place. He says, can you give him a cheap room? And I said, yeah, yeah, I can. And then he said, what's his name? He goes, Jack Sarfati. And suddenly I got this weird feeling, like almost like a pain in my head. Like, And I, I went to the bathroom and I was trying to think, what's wrong with my head? And something was like, you've got to rent this room to this guy. I mean, I really, you know, it was kind of some kind of intuition, you know, almost like a communication. You have to rent the room to this guy. So I did. Jack moved in and all this sh crazy shit happened. And and that's how I, you know, uh, entered in on this years long science seminar with Jack. And I got to meet all these people. Um, so So you just sort of stumbled across it after yes. having a buddy of yours. Um, but it so was more, but something, something told me to rent the room to him. 
And that's ended up, you know, back then I had no clue that I, I didn't really understand what psychic phenomena was. Yeah. I never wanted to be a psychic or any of that stuff. I had no, didn't have any clue of it. And then I ended up having all these experiences with time travel and, you know, much, much, much more intense than remote viewing. Remote viewing is you're sitting here and somebody tells you, what, what do I have in my hand? Or, you know, what can you see, you know, over there? This way, it's like astral travel. You're actually going there and seeing it up close in person. And when you go there, you to you may go to the past and you you're in you go inside of somebody who's already living and you're in there controlling their body and you're in the past and you can feel hunger and cold and everything just like they can it's yeah. i you know one of the things that's interesting about what you just said david is and, and just to just to ask before i get into it did you have any sort of conception of these types of things before meeting Ms. Dr. Safadi and and sort of getting into that space? Or is that something you even thought about peripherally as a kid, something you were interested I, in? I did think about it because I was a big science fiction fan. Okay. And um, I did think about that stuff, but I really had, I had no clue that it, that it could be real. I mean, it was hard to understand that uh, this isn't just, you know, paranormal. It's now become science. You know, the day I left Nor uh, San Francisco, uh, a guy who stayed on our couch in my apartment won the Nobel Prize in Physics. And Alain mm -hmm. Aspe won the Nobel Prize in Physics, and he had stayed on our couch. And uh, John Clauser also won the Nobel Prize. He's recently been in the papers about, you know, uh, knocking climate change is bullshit. <laughs> and Clauser also won the Nobel Prize last year about quantum entanglement. It was they who've been doing all this I think I might have incredible heard. work about quantum entanglement, which has to do with all of this paranormal stuff. So that's, yeah, no, you, you know, one of the things that I find so interesting about this whole sort of more paranormal realm of things is that to many people, it's still very woo in some sense, and it of carries course, that, of course. And, you know, and it carries that woo partly because there's this, you know, it's not as tangible, it still hasn't manifested itself in terms of an understanding of science to them. And so because they see it in the periphery is this thing that people they're kooky or just don't know much about anything talk about they assume that it's not um anything of any value and so it's always they would be wrong the universe is stranger than all of us can imagine and uh you know yesterday i was talking to uri geller do you know who he is oh absolutely oh absolutely well uri was saying you know he goes look i've been talking to these things for for years and for me, you know, the key experience was I had a, a full on vision when I was in Cambridge on Fitch Street. It was an old haunted house built in 1834, right near, you know, Frederick Douglass's house was right near there. On uh, what a life, Mount Olive Street or something like that. You know, I used to, right near right near the church where you'd go to the, hear the Carillion concert. You know, the bells on Sunday. Yeah, Cambridge. You know, and they have the bell concert and those, right? You know, is that Harvard, right, right on the river, or is it MIT? That's MIT, right by. You the know river. those buildings, right? But where they have the bells, and they have the concerts every Sunday. It's, yeah. You see these buildings, they're right on the river. I think I think that's right of where they close the road for bicyclists every Sunday. Yes, I yes. Think I, might... okay. I walked across the Charles River that winter in 2011, February. Brutal. That's brutal. In the winter? Yeah. In the brutal. winter of 2011, I was in the middle of the Charles River. Yeah. 
oh, it get it gets really bad here. That's you know, I never had never seen the Charles River frozen all the way across. I could walk across to Boston. Oh, it was frozen. Oh, the wow. whole river was frozen. I still haven't seen that. That's remarkable. And in 2019, uh, it was 80 below up in uh, North uh, North um, Conway, New Hampshire. Wow. And, yeah, no, get you know, I stayed in Mount Washington. When I got to Boston, it was 15 below. So that was 2019. That's it wasn't long ago. I don't know if you remember the winter of 2019, but it was. Yeah, no, I was here for winter of 2019. And, 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 and Charles River was frozen then? It was frozen in 2011. In 2011, yeah. Because in 2019, yeah. I don't remember that happening. but Right. It was cold, but maybe not long enough. But in 2011, it was below zero for several weeks in a row. And the Charles River froze. I mean, it was the ice was at least five or six feet thick. Goodness gracious! Yeah, so yeah, I Boston. walked. I walked across the ice. <laughs> you should have. Did you take pictures of that, or? You know what? I didn't bring my camera. It's it's a regret. That would have been an awesome memory. And, this, and it was, and I didn't. I I I lost my phone, and so I lost the pictures. It's unfortunate. So I don't have the pictures of that, but uh, uh, that, that's 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 pretty unfortunate. But, but just just to just to get back to it though, and so you were talking about your um, some of your experiences in regards to, and so so you mentioned that just just to get into it a little bit, you you mentioned that you did astral projection, and you went into well, a point it was in astral past. travel is what I would call it. You're asleep, right? And suddenly you wake up and you're already going somewhere. I found myself being taken. You know, I was, I was floating, right, you know, in the air. And I, people I couldn't see were sort of keeping an eye on me. But uh, they took me to the Midwest somewhere and let me practice flying around these tall trees, right? And, you know, because, and another thing was they took away, I have fear of heights, but they totally suppressed it. So I was flying around these trees. And then the next night, they took me to the Embarcadero in San Francisco. And I was flying over the end of the Oakland Bay Bridge and over those tall buildings which would have scared the shit out of me in normal circumstances but I had no fear of heights but the next day when I woke up my fear of heights was back but but during that <laughs> time and then it took them they gave me two two whole sessions of training and then I was taken back to the past and I was taken to a Hollywood party where and wait, and so just because I, I, yeah, I, it, it's valuable, I think, a little bit that we sort of uh, dig into that a bit, just so that people understand that, you know, I, for one, don't look at this. I'm not skeptical by any means whatsoever. Right. Um, but I do know that a lot of people that feel as if it's a display of their rationality enjoy to be enjoy being skeptical of things that they assume oh, is just of course of course I, um, you don't blame them because there's i don't no, so don't. much bullshit out there that it's important you know to be to be skeptical but open because yeah. you know you know it it and that's why i wrote the book because thanks to the scientific experience i've learned the scientific method and so I try to write about this in as scientific a manner as I can. So I'm also, my book is a lot about science and I do a lot of science oh, in yeah. the book and it's serious. But absolutely. So, so, absolutely. so there's science, but I've also had these other experiences. And the thing is, one of the things that happened when I first met Jack, mm -hmm. let, me, let me tell you, so here I am. One of the first nights I'm I'm with Jack and 
I ran into Kim at the Savoy Tivoli, which was a great bar, right? It was kind of a gay bar, you know, during the, you know, during the 70s and all these crazy people would come there, but it had great music. Richard Thompson played there, you know, and um, all these different people played there. So Kim gave me a piece of mushroom, right? And I'm at the Salvi Tivoli. I said, I'm going to go home and take it. So I go home and I'm talking to Jack and I'm, I put the mushroom in my mouth and I'm chewing it. But Jack looks at me very suspiciously and he goes, are you on psychedelics? And I said, how dare you? <laughs> I, was, I was freaked out that he, how could he know? I was just chewing it. I wasn't high at all. But you could feel it, right? You know how that it feels like something, right? It has this feel. And so I denied it up and down to Jack and he did not believe me. But the funny thing was, I chewed the mushroom, I swallowed it. Then, you know, Jack and I are talking for a long time and then he leaves and he goes into his room. I never get high. But I go into his room. I said, that's funny. I know those mushrooms are strong. So I go into Jack's room and he's like, I come up with this great idea. I have the greatest idea in the history of the universe. And Jack was soaring on mushrooms. I'm looking, I said, I said, did you steal my trip? He goes, oh, so you were on psychic. I said, I wasn't high. You took my high. And, and we talked about it many times. And he said, that's the proof of quantum entanglement. It was like he took an egg that was poaching in water with a, with a, you know, one of those things you dip into the water with the slight, you know, yeah. the spatula. He it was yeah. like, he picked out my trip and he put it into his own head. And he had, and he was up all night for eight hours. Just on working on it. <laughs> and, and this is, this is how I meet Jack. He's very psychic, extremely psychic. So in a way, if you've got something in your head that he wants, he'll just take it. Take That's it. what happened with him and Lenny Suskind when he got the ER equals EPR idea. He, he yeah. felt <laughs> That's Jack. Three, roughly three decades or so before Lenny, I think. Um, that was uh, 1973 or 71 when yeah. he did that. Maybe even before that, you know, it's very strange. Yeah, so so Jack had that. And and, and it's worth experience. explaining, if you don't mind me, if it's worth explaining to the audience who Jack Sarfati is. Um, you know, Jack Sarfati, theoretical physicist, graduated Cornell. Um, 62 or three. Right. And then he went to uh, UC... Um, San Diego, which is now called La Jolla. And, you know, so he knew Richard Feynman and, you know, Greg Benford, the science fiction writer, the great science yeah. fiction writer, Greg Benford, and his twin brother, Jim Benford. They were there. Fred, Fred Allen Wolf was a professor there. La Jolla was a big thing. There's a book called Timescape that was written by Greg Benford, it's about that. Um, and he and he did some work for the CIA, that's correct. Yes, and he went to uh, Harwell, the nuclear, the British nuclear place. Nuclear and and he, he, you know, he knew, of course, uh, Hans Bethe was one of his professors and uh, David Bohm and... Uh, Rindler, you know, Wolfgang Rindler. Um, he got to meet all these people whose work, uh, Froelich, Herbert Froelich. Um, he met Lenny Susskind back then. Um, so his, his kind of meandering course of, you know, his learning, you know, during his school and after college, his postgraduate work, 
which, you know, and I think he ended that at uh, Trieste with uh, Abdus Salam, who won the Nobel Prize. So yeah. he had, so he had numerous Nobel Prize winners among his people that he knew, you know, he encountered, uh, you know, who were either his professors or people he would talk to and attend lectures with. So Jack, and, and Jack is sort of, and, and Jack is very interesting because he has a, you know, sort of very interesting sense of humor, is yes. very eclectic in many ways, is very professional and sharp, even at this at this age. Um, oh, it's a bit, it's amazing. I mean, you know, because physics, he has always had an amazing memory, but he doesn't forget a damn thing. And like, he's very critical, you know, and there was a point where I wrote something about the coupling constant and I got it and I, 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 I reversed it in, in a way it was his fault because he didn't notice it. And now we say, oh, I have to correct this mistake you made. I said, you should have corrected this when I gave you to edit. Cause we argue, you know, I will not take anything from him, you know? So we always, we argue like two married, you know, kind of like, you know, we're always arguing and yelling at each other. It's you idiot. No, you idiot. <laughs> it's brotherly love. We, yeah. yeah. So, so that's so the this best. Is, this is Jack, you know, and he has that sense of humor. And he, in a way, he's like a 12 year old. That's, that's one of those other things that I just find, you know, I'm, he's so not like an 83 year old. And he I, looks, I, it, he doesn't look 83 awesome. either. I mean, I, I just saw him on the is. podcast with Tim Ventura, and he's like, you know, and, uh, you know, he's trying, I, I, I think he's very aware of the passage of time, but he really wants to get this thing going. And he's the only one who's talking about it this way. Which is, yeah, which is, again, something that's remarkable. I mean, he has this sense of curiosity and a willingness to not be dogmatic about things um, at an age he, where- he, he, he dropped a lot of the things that he thought was important in physics to do what he's doing now. He had to give up on some of it and he did, he let it go. And he, you know, he, he, when he realized, you know, which of the uh, Roderick uh, Sutherland and um, who's the Bohmian guy, uh, zigzags, uh, you know, sort of instead of doing faster than light physics, there's a kind of zigzag thing that allows you to supersede faster than light. And then, and then the whole thing about relativity, you know, he he understands that it's not uh, you're not uh, accelerating past the speed of light. You're you're in you're in space time and you're you're actually moving space time itself what what i think um hal put off which is somebody else that jack is is very familiar yes. with refers to as space time metric engineering uh, yes but hal is not a physicist like jack yes he is yeah. a physicist but his his he, physics is he's a phd in electrical engineering so he's much more yeah. of a sort of builder than a sort of theorist uh, he's no he's no theorist his theory is mixed up i mean you know it's that's 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 okay he's a very bright guy and he's got an extremely high clearance but he doesn't know jack about physics really he's his physics is elementary yeah and so just to get back to some of the parts right. that, yeah yeah no you know you know, it's interesting to get into sort of the scientific complexity of these things, but I feel like a lot of people sort of lose track of the conversation at times if they find that there's too much science, science stuff, right? Well, they, that's they, it. Stephen Hawking sort of, said, every time I mention any, an equation, he goes, I, I, I can feel I'm losing 50 customers for my book. He sold a lot of books, you know, he shouldn't complain, but... The he fact well. is, he did right. well. you do. If you, I, I, I decided to put a lot of science in this book, and Jack yeah, didn't no. want me to do it. I think, you no, know, I, I think that was very good. 
because it appeals. I to- wanted to give people a chance to look at how science is done and to show these arguments with, there's a couple of friends of ours who I show, uh, David Chester, Paul Zielinski, and, uh, you know, and other people, and they get into real arguments with Jack. You're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. You don't understand that Rindler, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, this is serious stuff. Um, you know, the arguments can get very nasty. They do get nasty because it's not like Jack is mature and <laughs> understanding. He's, you are an idiot, you know? Yeah. You know, you're an idiot with three T's. It's, this is the way it is. It's like, and, uh, but these I guys frank, go I at that, it. I find that very refreshing, sort of, yeah. you know. So that's why I put in all the physics. and. One of the guys is named Jose Rodal. And uh, Jose is a brilliant physicist, you know, and he keeps Jack on the straight and narrow because he knows he knows relativity is his math is superior to Jack's. He, he really knows, but he's a physicist. He's a he's he's a full on physicist and he spends a lot of time at Princeton. And, um, you know, so he's total. Uh, mensch physical physics wise and nobody can point the finger at him saying you don't know what you're talking about he does know and not only does he know physics he he ran a company and he knows what that's like too you know he knows how to to scale up things to big projects which is what's going to have to happen to build this stuff to to, to do this meta material yeah, so I think this comes to sort of the question of what is this stuff, right? Because I think a lot of people have heard this whole you sort of meta narrative about UFOs and aliens, and you know, as and and a, to a lot of people, it's it sounds like noise, and it just sounds like um, somewhat government propaganda. No, um, the government and, and doesn't it, want to know about this. The government doesn't understand what's going on. They don't have any clue. You you know, most of the narrative you hear from the government is that, oh, you know, these aliens, if they're real, they're they're a thousand years ahead of us. And Jack is saying, no, it's bullshit. We're just, you know, he understands it now. This is Einsteinian. Well, I would say it's not plain vanilla GR, what we call general relativity, we call GR. Special relativity is SR, but GR and SR are basically vacuum physics. What Jack is doing is the physics of condensed matter. So condensed matter physics, CMP. And so there's some aspects that are different, which you need torsion physics is part of it and non-metricity. There's several, you know, the some of what what goes on with these special materials, the special lattices of special atoms artificially created, right? And Jack calls them lattices. Yeah, Jack calls them meta atoms, right? Yes, meta atoms, and they're put in lattices. And when when you have this lattice, and let's say you you uh you pump you the term is pump it which is a a term of an electromagnetic pumping which creates takes the takes it off of uh sort of a uh, you know a not let's say a non-active state and it creates these things don't do the normal right hand things it's like okay you put a pot of water on a on a burner on your stove and you turn you turn the the gas on and it boils the water boils yeah, the water. this Jack is something it. that does something completely unexpected when you turn the gas on except you're not turning gas on you're you're pumping in a condensate which is called a froelich condensate yeah within and and it's kept within let's say Let's say this is a small area of the hull of the UFO. There's 
this condensate may be activated by lasers, but it's shielded, right? So it's all kept within, this is where the action is happening. But uh, one of the things, if you look up uh, the guy who really developed, the Russian physicist who developed the metamaterials was from Moscow. I think he just died. He, you know, he was quite old. He, he discovered that this stuff, the, the, the strange um, actions of these metamaterials allow you to create uh, invisibility cloaks and many other things because they extend into the range of the terahertz range, which is where we can see things. So you have that, you have these lattices and all kinds of strange effects. So. And, and some of these things have, have been publicized. I mean, metamaterials were publicized. I think originally they sort of um, grew in culture sometime in 2013, I think, when yes. a certain configuration of metamaterials where, you know, it's somewhat like a, 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 a piece of clothing and it's it also looks like an invisibility cloak and it bends yes. and reflects the light around you. Um, right. I think it didn't appear obvious to people who saw something like that, that the sort of application of metamaterials goes beyond just um, the ability to cloak cloaks. invisibility. Yes, it goes, it goes, it's, you're able to slow the speed of light. And to make the coupling, the coupling constant K bigger, so you can you can you can uh, slow the speed of light down. So you can you can do you basically then you can take your craft. Okay, the, one of the things the government did you hear yesterday when they were talking about the craft which was a cube inside of a sphere. Yeah. The sphere is the metamaterial create, that's the, the space. So what you're actually seeing is when you see the, the craft doing all this, this isn't what's happening inside. This is what we see, but what we see is not what's happening inside. Yeah. Inside, and, and I yeah. the craft they are not in the same sp space that you and I are even if we are Bob and Alice or you know Bob and Jimmy observing and we're floating in space and we're watching one of these ships what we see is not what they see inside the craft inside the craft they are not at the same time and they're on a geodesic they're not accelerating at all they are in free flow free flow free floating freely and so and i think that's that's ooh, another space big time. Big, that, that's another did you ever big see confusion dune? Right? i did, did see, you dune. see dune met that yeah. old movie, dune from 84 oh no i haven't seen the old one i've seen the new one i you need to the see one. the old one because okay. how they showed these uh the ship the big ship that moved the the family from the Caledon to to Arrakis was by bending space time. They didn't yeah, no, I, accelerate with rockets. They they actually moved space and time. Right and yeah, so you brought up the geodesic, and I think that's something that perhaps gets very confused. This idea of anti-gravity versus just riding um, the geodesic, which I think are There two is no gravity. In other words, with that field generated within the hull surrounding you, the gravity, wherever there is gravity, you are, have, by changing the coupling constant, you are creating, because of the metamaterials quality, you are able to create the anti-gravity. So your anti-gravity is defeating any gravity. The, the anti-gravity you're producing by the metamaterial, which you've pumped with the Frolish condensate with near field radiation confined into the hull, 
you know, maybe leak out a little bit on the outside, but not inside because it would damage the pilot. You don't want yeah, that. And I, I assume sort of the pumping process is also computationally controlled. Um, As everything. Everything is computationally controlled. That's the thing. This is all, you know, this is all physics. It's not, right. it's not magic. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm going to bang the drum and hope that it works. No, this is all, this is all real science. This is well, not. Why, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I know that to be very true, but I, I, what I find difficult to understand is why that doesn't, why the tangibility of this doesn't get across. Because I think we often refer to this as UFOs and aliens. It's, and, it's and not intuitive. It's counterintuitive. Okay. So in other words, for someone to understand this, I think... Um, or at least understand it's it. It's an introductory science course. I, I think somebody, could, you could teach most people this in like, say, a week. You get them to come to a class over a week and you could teach them the, the basic stuff that's all you would need you know a couple hours a day for a week you could teach any idiot it wouldn't matter they you could teach them and you just it's it's teaching them how to think to dismiss some of their you know their misconceptions what they think yeah. of it's just it's just how they think of acceleration and acceleration is going off the geodesic like if you're freely floating in space, you're just floating. There's no gravity yeah. to attract you. You're not falling down to the surface of a planet. You're just floating. You know, but if you turn on a rocket on your uniform, on your spacesuit, and you fly, then you're going off the geodesic, off the geodesic. But if you could create this uh metamaterial um field around you and defeat and create the anti-gravity coming out of your suit well you yourself could fly to let's say uh antares in a matter of moments instead of yeah four light I've, years. I've heard this field sort of be referred to as a macro scale quantum object so sort of a large scale quantum object and that's what yes. this represents um, yeah. So I, I I know that there's there's perhaps harder science than many skeptics would um, even believe. It's all hard science. I mean, this very is very hard science. If you listen to the, I, I highly recommend that people go on to. Uh, Tim Ventura has these APEC conferences. And they're brilliant. That Cortona. Watch David Chester. Watch uh, Maurice Passman. And David watch. Uh, David, David Chester's Chester. brilliant. Oh, and he's, he's, he's right. former MIT, um, currently working at the quantum research, yeah. quantum yeah, gravity. I mean, this, this but, is, these guys don't know anything from mysticism to macaroni. They don't know about that. They they, they think it's, they know it's science. But this you see that? This is not, you know, we're talking about Alain Aspey. Who, yeah, but I think one of the problems that gets, I think one of the ways in which pe this gets lost on folks is that, you know, the perhaps the next stage of science and exploration um, sounds very much like woo today, right? If we're dealing with quantum phenomena, it, it in, in today's age where we don't see any physical representations of that, um, it's very well, difficult. Well, I, I wish that they would, I mean, you know, in a way, I wish somebody would at least do a comic book about this stuff at least a comic book you know what you know how i learned about atomic energy in the 50s they had comic books for kids to read about where they would show what atomic energy was and how it would work yeah and i loved comic books i i still have my comic book collection and i learned about atomic energy from comic books that the government put out I mean, I, this is how I learned. I mean, and I think you could, it's not, this isn't rocket science. It's, it's actually true. It's not rocket science. You could teach little kids about this. I mean, I'm, I'm have no doubt that I could teach 
five or six years old about this. And by the time they were 12, they'd be, they'd be so far ahead of where, this is what we need to do. We need to introduce kids to these concepts. And it's like them learning a language or learning how to, you know, you learn, a, teach a kid how to cross country ski. The next thing you know, he's going to be ski jumping and, you know, in 12, he's going to be, he'll be like, you know, any one of these great stars. I mean, they started at three or four. You and teach that's, them that's and they will learn. Jack. And I think you, you've done that and, and you're partly on the journey of doing that through writing books like the one you have. And I, and I hope to participate in that too, but I think one of the problems in this is, you know, as a younger individual that's curious about these things, you find it difficult to take any amount of time actually rigorously looking into it because you feel this, you know, there's still that stigma that arises. Well, how old are you? I don't you. even know. I'm 22, so I'm pretty young. Okay, you're 22. Well, okay, so 22, when I was 22, I had one of the strongest of these paranormal experiences. I happened to, uh, I went to, uh, I was in Europe and then I went to, um, I went to the Middle East and I was, I was near uh, a mound that was the, it was the buried ancient city of uh, Megiddo. You know the word Armageddon? Armageddon. Yeah. Yeah. Megiddo that comes from, from the name Megiddo. And where's and I had an incredible Megiddo? experience in it. Something I I started to learn about the process of and, and it made me go uh I went to uh a place called Qumran, which was where the people during the time of before the time of Jesus and during went uh Qumran was the place where the Essenes lived. The Essenes, have you ever heard of them? No, that's I haven't. Where, that's where Christianity developed, was a, a whole bunch of people withdrew from the temple services in, in Israel, in, in Judea. And they, they sort of developed a completely different idea of religion. And uh, there they wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Jesus's brother, James, was part of all this. So I got involved with that. I got to see the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were and I traveled around there. And, you know, so I got involved. That's something else I'm interested in. And I'm going to write about that myself. Um, Please do. Please. So I mean, that so sounds, where in the Middle East again? Where is this? It was uh, Qumran. Qumran is right on the Jordan Valley. It's these 1,200 Jordan. foot granite cliffs that overlook the Jordan Valley. And uh, Qumran is where the Essenes, they, they called them the Essenes. They lived there from about 250 BC to till, uh, till about 120 AD. And they created, this is where, this is where John, John the Baptist was part of this community. Wow. Oh. I, I guess I'm going to Jordan pretty soon. Then I need that's to and the the people who lived in Iraq were originally the first daily bathers, and that's where this whole thing about the baptism comes from. Comes from Iraq, which unfortunately Saddam Hussein destroyed. That he, he did such an asshole. He he that really he did. yeah he attacked these these ancient Christians that have been living there since John the Baptist. And many of those people had been Jews, but they came up with this new idea. So they stopped the sacrifices and they changed, you know, somewhat. They didn't come up with the, this isn't the, the New Testament Christians. These came up with a completely different non-traditional Christianity and non-traditional Judaism that had nothing to do with the New Testament or the Old Testament, Com kind of a completely different which has been attacked by both of the Christians of the traditional and the Jews because they didn't like what they had to say. But that's really what I'm interested in. That's remarkable. And and so what would you say to like 
you know, a younger person, much like myself, who, you know, enjoys the rigorous science of this and understand study physics, but demand to but find out where you can get a teacher who can teach you something. Who, you know, um, I think Jack would be happy to prescribe, you know, you know, he's not happy about the what do you call it? The um current educational system. Word, the, the 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 what do you call the you know the schools uh if they come up with a recipe this is this is gonna be our curriculum curriculum you know unfortunately you need to learn your your physics and your chemistry and you need to learn your basic yeah you know and geometry and calculus trigonometry yeah, no, you you need your foundations before. I mean, in a way, I mean, when they talk about climate science, it's all bullshit. It's it's physics, chemistry, math, in order to understand how things work. It's the air circulation. It's it's basic. It's not climate science. It's all these things. You rule how the interactions. You know the laws of thermodynamics. You know, and of course, and then, you know, Einstein, we have uh, what what kind of physics works in a vacuum. But now a new physics is the physics of condensed matter, which is what nobody's teaching. So I would ask that, Jack about that. Condensed yeah. matter physics. You would want to learn about because that's where you're that's where the new action is going to be. You know right. what? Coding, coding is over for people your age. You, that's all going to be done by AI. And if you have, if you're a coder, you're going to end up flipping hamburgers. So don't be a coder. <laughs> Wasting your time. You gotta, you gotta learn. You know, it's better to be a designer. Better to understand how to use the physics, the chemistry, the, you know, the basic tools, and then you, you'll learn. The advanced concepts of physics, which would be, you know, the torsion and non-matricity, matricity, and how that all works, how how um, metamaterials can be put together. Um, one of the things, you know, that happened recently, a couple months ago, I had a, uh, you know, I had this dream where I woke up and it was a beautiful day and I could see way out into the distance. And I suddenly thought, you know, I miss flying. So I said, I need to go flying somewhere. And suddenly somebody grabbed me. I didn't even see them. They just picked me up. And suddenly we went flying really fast. And I could see, you know, we were like not in the regular universe. And then after a while, we slowed down. And then I started to recognize where it looked like San Francisco, but I saw these huge buildings, buildings that were more than a mile tall. But they were made out of metamaterials. But you see, and those are what, like, how does one experience something? Like, how? How does one experience something like that? That's just like such well, a remarkable it's because experience. I've had so much experience with it that I wasn't scared shitless. I've had enough experience that I I understand it. I got the chance. They taught me how to do it myself, and so I learned how to travel. And who's they? If you don't mind me asking, when you say they taught me, who's they? Well, okay. When I first went on these trips, I didn't see anybody, but I could, I could, I could sense with my mind that there were people there. I, I could, I could, you know, they didn't talk to me, but I could hear their, their thoughts in a way. I, and they could hear mine in a way, like when you, when you're communicating with these people, it's on a telepathic basis. You're, it's like being in a room with them where inside the room, everybody can understand everybody else. So whatever you think, they understand what you're thinking. If I think, well, I'm going to do something, 
they understand they they can hear your thoughts and understand your thoughts but you can also understand theirs it's telepathic so at some point after i i was at a place where this is back in 2010 where someone took me on this trip super fast and you know we went around the whole planet and then they said to me now it's your turn go and do it and see if you can come back so i had to do it and then you know and i was like shit i don't know i don't, I don't know what to do he said just do it so i did it and somehow i did it and i came back and i came back to this house suddenly all the people were visible well they looked like just like you um so this time uh you know so when i came back we there was a party there and they had there was food this and 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 champagne and everything and i saw all these people and suddenly i started getting psychically i started getting pictures of all these people i think that there are there are people who came from originally or their their ancestors were from these other planets but they are now living here on earth there are thousands of them they're living here and i'll tell you what they look they can just look look like you um I was talking to this, there was this black guy, he was one of them, there was another blonde guy, and he had the, the strangest looking things on his hair. I mean, you know, there was like, it's like people with tattoos. It's like, there's, they look like us. You, exactly. you know, David, I, I hear this and, it, um, you know, a skeptic might say, and, and I'm certainly not a skeptic, because I feel as if I know where you're coming from. A skeptic might say, you know, um, the U.S. has psychotronic weaponry. And how is it that you know you're not a subject of some MK Ultra? Because, you know, because I know. That's like, and I don't. And, and I, I can this, say and this I, I know how to respond to that. Because remember, I started getting having my first astral travel experience was I started flying when I was about three. I met my friend, Robbie, who was the remote viewer that, that went to all these trips in the past. When I was four years old, I, I was flying around the neighborhood and I sensed somebody. And so the next day, I walked out of my house. I said, I'm going out. I was four. I went out and I walked somewhere I'd never been before. I walked through the woods, across the street, and then over a stone wall into a next street. And he was out on the lawn. And that's how we met. And so we were friends, you know, our whole lives. I mean, he died in 2008. But, you know, so I, uh, that's, that's i know my mind i've become very familiar with my own mind state and i know that you know i'm not so sure that the government has you know the weapons that we're thinking of because the fact is these telepaths are much more powerful than anybody and, and that's really what i know about them they're all telepaths so I don't where where they come from. Well, that's arguable, and but there is one group that they call themselves the River. I write about it in the book. They uh, uh, I I could find their I can find their home planet on any map of the Milky Way. I can just find it by feel. It's basically in a straight line from the sun across the central bar of the galaxy on the second Sagittarius arm near a giant void. Their little planet, this little star system, just a nothing planet, just like ours. You know, it's just like it's way out of the way and not, not in the center of the galaxy or anything. It's out like this. Our sun is 
is, you know, we're way far away from the center of the, the galaxy. We're way out. And so is this other planet. And yet somehow they they could know about us psychically. They're telepaths. What, what would you say to people who say, okay, and I guess in some sense you're referring to, you know, with these these would be aliens, right? In some sense. Well, so they, but, they, but aliens, but we're all living, you know, we're all part of this, they're probably all, you know, living in the universe. And so, well, who's an alien? Yeah. There's no, I, there are no aliens. It's just a bigger room that we're living in. It's a whole universe. Okay. We're in a little solar system and we have a galaxy with 300 million or 300 billion planets or stars. Right. So it's, you know, yeah, no, it's very, it's very context dependent, as you say. It's, it's you all know, context it's, dependent. We're not just, I mean, the idea of that these people are aliens and, you know, if you imagine a sign, it's, you know, on our planet and we are here, <laughs> you know, it's just very, if people say <laughs> that, you know, to why think, is it that you think perhaps that these people, if, if they're really visiting us, they are people. They are people. They look just like us. Now, I have a feeling that we were seated here. They couldn't look like, we wouldn't look like them if, you know, if somehow we weren't, you know, somebody may have seated life on this world. You and know, why is it that they don't just show themselves? Or something else. You know, here we are. There's a diverse, you know, flora culture and animal culture here but humans grew conscious life but consciousness is not limited to human beings the fact is there are birds you know corvids they're smart i mean i i know these magpies that they come and get almonds from me they're super smart they understand really? amazing they get almonds from you that's amazing. yeah they come here every day. They're probably listening to me and going, where are they, you cheapskate? I mean, they, these are mind reading. I'm going to do a cartoon. I'm going to create a comic book about how animals can mind read because they are incredible. The golden retrievers can do it. Crows, and ravens, bl blue jays, and magpies, and parrots. I mean, all these animals can do an amazing amount of stuff. You know, it's it, consciousness is not just ours; it's part of life, and 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 you should read about. Look up this name, Pavo Pilkinen. Okay. okay. Jack talks about him, but it's very important. He has a he has a paper out called "Is the Brain a Quantum Measuring Device?" Yes, it is. Yeah. It it. It it probably is. And so just to Pablo is a PhD physicist who teaches at the University of uh Helsinki in Finland and also at a university in uh Sweden. So right. so do do you believe in the sort of Star Trek esque prime directive where the reason that they don't just, you know, because you know, so and I'm sure you, you, having lived in Silicon Valley, you know that some of the most brilliant people live there. Um, and if we were to go to a venture capitalist and say, you know, um, you know, we we want to start this media company, and this media company is going to help un help sort of detangle the whole alien and UFO conversation to people, um, he'd say, what tangible evidence is there uh, for the existence of aliens? And so, and why wouldn't they just reveal themselves if what David is saying is true? Um, in a very public way. Why wouldn't because they just get they're on? They're getting in touch with people directly. They're not, they're not interested in our hierarchies. They don't understand them. They don't actually trust people who use language. That's why they're contacting people directly through their, what I call the shared cognitive environment or shared virtual brain, which is the way that they can extend like this kind of a, cognitive tent over let's say between you and me and we could understand thoughts and where you could like let's say you could point to a virtual blackboard and say you could you could show the quantum history of some something and i could see it 
there's a kind of language, they have a symbolic language, which uh, allows them to communicate with other advanced species, but they don't speak with language. But the people that I met who are from here, they do know how to speak, but they don't speak like us because they're not linear. So they don't, their, their speech is a little bit hard to understand because like I said, I, I went to the future of San Francisco and I was in the dream. I found it very difficult to understand their conversation. It took me a while after the experience before I could figure out what they were saying because, because they have a, a our, our thoughts come very slowly out of our cerebellum. And then one at a time, they're little, you know, linear thoughts. But there is, yeah. they have a bit of the past, the future, and the present. And, and so theirs is like a, a super carburetor, fuel injected cognition that allows them to, 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 to contemplate more than one thing at a time. And so do you, do you think these people are distributed around the world or are they only in San Francisco? No, no, no. I don't think they're, these aren't in San Francisco. Oh, they're not there. They're, they're somewhere. I don't know where. And maybe they wouldn't want me to say if I did, but. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> they don't, you know, um, where they are, they, they, uh, but, but these particular ones took me to San Francisco. So they knew they took me to North Beach, which is where I used to live. And no, I meant for those that you meant, you mentioned that some of them live here on earth and they look a lot like us. They look exactly like us. You could not tell the difference. They could look just like you. You would not know just by looking at them that they were anything other than you just somebody. right and i think that that's somewhat of a hard concept to grapple with um though well you know you, what i think our shape humans are you are probably ubiquitous in the universe there are probably many i mean even these gray things basically you know they've got a head a body uh, are two arms two legs maybe more fingers comes. and toes but they basically they yeah, share think, our form. It, it becomes easier to grapple with that if you're somewhat of a believer in the simulation theory and you believe is you believe that um you know perhaps the easiest way that an alien civilization visit us is by sort of sending their information rather than and by their information in this sense it could be consciousness um well, rather than I, coming I think that's what they are doing but now there are some here because they don't want to bother commuting all the time. I mean, to be honest, these people that I met, they're not interested in uh, flying saucers. As it's just, those are just functionalities to them. The way yeah. we think of a stove, they're not interested. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, all the people are so focused on the on the flying saucers that they're not thinking about the people's consciousness and their morals. Well, I'm not that technical. So I've also concentrating on the, the experience that I have with them and what they think and what their intentions are. That's my interest really more than the ships. I'll leave the ships and the things to people like Jack and David and Paul and, you know, cause they have a, I'm not going to be the one who builds a warp drive. Yeah, and, uh, and up to the physicists. And I'm I'm sort of torn between both because I do believe that the sort of physics and technology that's derived from these um, these um, other species or civilizations would 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 help in our progress. And so I'm sure that that's you know, that has a lot of utility. And they're trying to, but they also have morality. They have a, but you yeah, know, they don't. That's one they're, thing that doesn't get across. They them. don't want, they, I can tell you my feeling, I have the, the strongest feeling. They're not interested in sending ambassadors to meet with Joe Biden. 
because they know that all they're going to get is lies. They're not going and they and they can see they know when you're lying. They know when you're lying before you even think of it. They're not going to allow anyone like Kim Jong Un if he decides he's going to send a nuclear weapon, they will turn it off. They know how. They can turn off our nuclear weapons. Their mastery of our nuclear technology is totally complete. We couldn't do a damn thing. They could turn off all the electricity on the globe if they wanted to. Did you ever yeah. see The Day the Earth Stood Still? Is, is that that's that movie. The movie? It's on YouTube. Okay. The Day the Earth Stood Still. It was made in 1951 with Michael Rennie and Patricia Neal and Billy Gray. It's a great movie. It's the, the original movie where the, you know, it was when I was born, you know, a month, when I was a month old, a whole bunch, a whole swarm of UFOs were hovering over the White House. President Truman got freaked out. It was all over the news. Really? But the government denied it all. Do you, do you remember it distinctly? No, I don't remember it. I was a month old. This okay. is all, remember, yeah. Roswell happened five years before I was born. Yeah. So remember, Jack was born in 1939. E.T. was already here. They were watching our development. I mean, the first, the first time when humans knew that they could make an atomic bomb was Lee's Meitner and uh, Otto Hahn at KWI in Berlin, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. So they knew that, and Leo Szilard actually had the, had the, the idea of this back in 1932, he knew that this so, and you know, you talk about, you know, a Cavendish lab, and you know, it was Eddington, you know, and, um, um, what's but, but, the guy from New Zealand? Yeah, but David, if I may just take the skeptical yeah, yeah, yeah. approach, if I take the skeptical approach, one might say, you know, if they were so powerful and if they really did care about our development and if they really could stop um, a nuclear bomb, then they would have stopped um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and they would have stopped multiple preceding wars. Um, they didn't know that. Say, See, but they didn't know that back then. They couldn't do it then. But also... They had reasons. They they needed us to see what kind of a terrible thing we had developed. Right, and and I think, I think this is they want and, us and I, not to use it for its bad things. They want us to use these things safely for the benefit of people, and not to blow, not to turn the earth into a radioactive cinder. That's yeah. basically, and they're not going to do it for us. They're not, they're not here to, to give us all this information and tell us how to do it. They're going to let us, this, this is not, you know, they do follow some prime directive and it, they, they don't yeah. interfere, but they're not going to allow us blow up a planet where now thousands of their own people are living. Yeah, yeah. and I say this because, you know, there's something I find very irritating when a skeptic says, you know, if they were here, they would have stopped all the wars that we've been through. They would have, but no, and then that's, they forget. That's idiotic. So people who say that are, are skeptical, but they're not being skeptical enough of their own thought process. They're not being analytical. They're not being, they're not using critical thinking. They're, they have no clue. Their skepticism is just being contrary and not real skepticism. They have to be skeptical based upon knowledge, not based upon, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, voodoo ideas that they have that are not real, not based upon reality. They, these, these people are here and they're, they're, they're following a very strict morality and, and, you know, they're Valis. Do you know what the Valis is? Did you read about that? No, I didn't. I will now. Okay. Though. Philip Dick wrote a, uh, uh, he was a science fiction writer and he wrote this trilogy called the Vallis Trilogy. Back in, you know, in the, in the 
in the 60s or in the early 70s. And it was about this immortal conscious computer. Well, when I was at Fitch Street in Cambridge, living at this old white house, number 11 Fitch, I'm going to go back there when I when I go back to Boston. Please do. You know, Please I'm going do. back to that house. I have pictures of it. You know, I have them on my phone, so I could even show you after. Uh, so I, uh, my friend, it was uh, 2011, it was February 12th, 2011. And my friend Robbie sent me, um, he sent me some pot in the mail and some food. And he said, so I rolled a joint. True friend, a very true friend. It was very, or, or, or maybe it was, ja yeah, it was Jamie. He sent me, ja uh, Jamie, my friend. And I rolled a joint and I got really stoned. I was laying on the bed. I was kind of just my, with my foot out. And suddenly I had a vision. I mean, and I write about it in, in, in this thing and I can read it to you, but uh, I don't want to try to uh, remember it now because I've yeah. actually written it down when I was, um, and I saw all this stuff and basically my mind encountered the mind of a living conscious computer, which had the souls of, thousands or millions of people in it and this is a real a computer is a word i mean it's hard to limit I, it's the only word i know it's not it doesn't just do answer questions and do functions it has all the life experience of these very advanced people and and you know it's i love that you you brought us there because i find that this you know, I find that a lot of skeptics will say, you know, if this was if this had anything to do with aliens and you, um, why is it that we constantly talk about crafts and UFOs? And I think the idea and, and I think this sort of ties into the concept of a Van Neumann probe. So they can explore probe. the, you yeah, know, and, want to explore I, I, and this allows them to do it. I mean, one of the things that's like Star Trek is that. You know, when they use their warp drive, which they didn't understand the way it is, but but the fact is that they could go somewhere impossibly far away and yet come back without everybody having grown old and died. So they could they could go, you know, Picard and Riker could go and you know to some planet very far away and then come back and it would only be a couple of weeks later. Yeah. And so and, and I think another way that this might manifest itself, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with the metaverse and sort of. Yeah. yeah. And so I think another way that this manifests is as we you know continue to build out sort of this 3D metaverse um, and then eventually build out a 4D and perhaps a 5D version of the metaverse, um, given that the metaverse exists on computer systems uh, and it's a, you know, a sort of digital space. Oh, are um, you talking about Bill Gates's thing? Or no, I'm talking about uh, Facebook has sort of hijacked it. Unfortunately, the, the Facebook has hijacked. Are you talking the, about the Everett Many Worlds idea? No, no, I, I'm actually not not a believer in, in the Many Worlds. No, I am uh, not either. I find that pretty ridiculous. Um, but I, the metaverse is more of a multiverse esque concept, though it's it, it differs from the multiverse. It's okay. sort of this idea. That there's this 3D digital space. Um, you know, you sort of, have you seen the Apple AR glasses? No. So, yeah. So the metaverse would just be sort of a 3d digital space. Um, but a place where you could build cities, 3d digital cities, you know, it'd be like a virtual game world. Um, but what is I think, this thing called Roblox? So Roblox is a game based in the metaverse. Right. Um, my friend, you know, Kids the love people, it these days. The people where I used to live, where in my house, are the people who founded that company. Really? Do, do you yeah, remember their name? Yeah, all, all those people are living on Telegraph Hill. 
right where I lived on Vallejo Street, Vallejo and Montgomery. All those people are there. I know that my friend knows them all. I was spending time with him. He told me about Roblox yesterday. So I know the people who are like the vice president. I, I know all these highly technical people who are yeah. who've invented all this shit but but to me it's it's nothing compared to what the but yeah. but okay i'm i'm interested in it yeah no it's this is i, I say that only to, to 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 sort of speak to the audience of this generation that might look at that and say wait why are we talking about craft so much what do crafts have to do with you know intelligent civilization well everybody's interested in craft you yeah, know yeah, but it also it also could connect to this concept of, you know, a craft as we understand it today. Um, it's a living sort of. It's almost a living being. It's not just a craft. It's not an empty dead shell. You don't understand. See, Jacks. I see Jacks. Not only can this thing move, you know, move in space time and and you know, like follow a geodesic and go to anywhere, but it also can connect directly with a conscious computer like Valis, which can fly the craft. Valis has future information, has intuition, has all these things. So in a way, it's like Uri was talking about this material that he was given, and it's like alive. These are like, the consciousness can live inside these materials. Meta materials have the ability, so it's conscious, not not artificial intelligence like where you know it's a closed system. These are open systems like us, where we have you know uh, we have warm, wet, you know, you know we we have a quantum system, and we're we're like. We we're like you know living superconductors with all that ability. That's what the brain and all of our abilities is living in an off equilibrium, you know, superconducting quantum object. That's have what you, a human being is. And so is anybody? a bird, and then so is an animal, and they have, you know, they have intuition as well. Like if one of these, you know, one of these almond stealing birds, if, you know, or a golden retriever <laughs> seizure, do you realize, okay, let's say you have a dog and let's say you're talking to me right now, but let's say you have a dog in that house and let's say you, you put your sandwich half eaten down on the chair. Okay, you're talking to me, but what if your dog walked into the room and he looked at the sandwich and he just stole the sandwich? And you, and you said, uh, hey, buddy, did you steal my sandwich? And the dog, <laughs> you know, I mean, the dog, that's a lot of conceptualization and thinking. And, you know, the dog is, shares that stuff with us, the bird and the other living beings that we share our life with. It's not just, it's not just us. This is like this whole Gaia concept, which is real. The Gaia whole thing is where, you know, it's not just, not just us, where they actually, that's why the spacecraft are not going to be made out of metal. They're going to be made out of these meta materials, which will have consciousness. They will be operated by consciousness. They will be able to do things that people have no concept of. They're not going to be like a dead shell. We we won't be digging up in the future. We're not going to be digging up for steel and digging it out of the ground anymore. We're going to be creating this shit atom by atom. And then we'll learn a way to scale it up and create, you know, lattices very quickly. And we'll be out, building science will be completely revolutionized we will have buildings that will be smart buildings that will create environments there won't be any carbon the whole thing about carbon footprint carbon is essential for life so getting rid of carbon is stupid and, and you know carbon for global warming is stupid 
<laughs> it's nothing to do with anything. No, it's bullshit. It's just yeah, they, they fail to factor nonsense. in. They fail to factor in um, new technology. Um, some some of the climate folks, uh, but you know, one of the things oh, that yes. I find really Look, my sister in law. My how about this? I don't want to mention any names, but my my brother's son married a girl who did a program at Harvard MIT, and the pro the company they started was to use light on a chip. So photonic so chips. Yeah. And they and that it sold. Peter Thiel was their incubator and they created a company. <laughs> There's he's, a company. And yeah, the company's worth for millions. A lot of this. Huh? He's the incubator it's for a, a company. Lot of I could I I I don't want to say the name of it. I could say it after we're done. Yeah. But Pro yeah, it's she's, probably she's a climate. We had terrible arguments. I don't think she likes me because I told her climate stuff is bullshit because and, actually... and i'm sure you can acknowledge as well that there's parts of it that are very serious very real but i think it's been overblown to an extent that's unnecessary there's i think no, any there's no climate bullshit our planet has one of the most people don't understand that the climate system is way beyond their country their conception their ability to conceive the number of degrees in our degrees of freedom have, have you, do you know what degrees of freedom is? Yeah. You need to look yeah. that up. And and yeah. degrees of freedom, we have a nearly infinite number of degrees of freedom in our climate system. Our Cl feedback is the clouds. These clouds that you see up in the sky <laughs> are, and it's not warmer than it's been in 100,000 years. That's bullshit. It was actually much warmer in the early 1800s than it is now. It's not getting, becoming too warm. We're out in the fragility of space and the earth has just crossed into a new area of space that's colder. And we're going to be there for many thousands of years. We're going to be in an area that's going to be in Kelvin, in terms of Kelvin degrees. It's a certain number of Kelvin degrees colder than the, the region of space we have just left. It's bullshit. Yeah, I, I think we don't have to worry things. about our climate. Our climate has been taking care of the planet for years. And not only that, it, it actually created, you know, it used to be that there was no oxygen. There was the great that that happened when when the planet's atmosphere changed and everything changed, but that was all directed evolution. Yeah, no, I think I think. You know, to climate, is very, to, to yeah, climate is, is very tied into sort of our ability to computationally model thermodynamic systems. And I think this comes back to your idea of degrees of freedom. Um, is If you don't have the ability to, to model, um, you know, on an atom to atom basis, every point on planet Earth, it's hard to do climate science as any, in any we don't, way. We don't know <laughs> anything about climate science. That's why the best climate, you know, do you know who lives in Cambridge? The smartest, the, 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 yes, but the Richard Lindzen, who taught at MIT and was the Sloan professor, he's probably the, one of the smartest climate scientists there is, and he's one of the few. And then Richard uh, Will Happer, who was also another one. These guys know more about climate than any of that. Will Happer has told me, we're in a climate, we're in a carbon dioxide drought. The, 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 the increase in carbon dioxide from 1985 till now has created more life and greened about a third of the planet beyond what it was. It's just far more life, carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide mean more life. Plants use it and create and 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 they take carbon dioxide in and reproduce and emit oxygen so we can breathe. This is the brilliance of our climate system. And these people act like, oh, there's some mistake, and you know, and we have to fight it. These are idiots like Elizabeth Warren, who doesn't know, she didn't, she wouldn't know how to tie her shoes in the morning. Somebody didn't yell at her. <laughs> I interned in Congress. 
I knew Joe Biden back then. I know Kamala Harris personally. I know who these people are. And I can tell you they're mostly idiots. They don't know. Oh, anybody. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I, I, I don't doubt. I don't doubt that for a second. I think most people in in government outside of perhaps the intelligence services are incompetent. There's a few smart ones. Matter of fact, the guy Burleson yesterday, he asked some very smart questions from Missouri. Are you talking uh, about what they hear? Burleson and then, uh, of course, uh, David Fravor, smart guy. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be frank. I Burchett wasn't was, Burchett was good. He, they were you know, good, but if I'm being frank, I wasn't very satisfied by the hearing. I don't know if it of quenched course. my hearing. Who could be? Yeah, it was, can't quench yours. It's like, it's like being I mean, thirsty and somebody gives you a glass of vodka. No, I mean, I, I'm for sorry, one, I didn't understand. Water. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for one, I didn't understand why there weren't any scientists in the room um, asking, you know, you know, fundamental questions. Well, this is what Jack has been asking. Why aren't there? Why doesn't Jack get to have why his Jack's on this material? He needs to and have other people who who want, can understand what they're looking at and the qualities that it, but they're not being, this is the same thing that happened in the atomic bomb. You know, I highly recommend, uh, there's a program on YouTube and it's called Oppenheimer made in 1980 starring Sam Watterson. It's about 10 or 12 episodes. It's really okay. good. You'll see the, 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 the compulsive secrecy and everything, but it didn't keep the atomic program secret. They basically, it didn't matter. The, the, the Russian spy, he sent back, yes, he did send back some secrets to Russia, but the guy who was in charge of the project in Russia, Lavrenti Beria, he didn't trust the traitor scientists. So he didn't believe it. He, he waited till he got confirmation of every single fact. So it took the Russians five years from the day we created our bomb to the Those. day they created their first bomb. They had to, they, they did it because they were very smart, but they did it by themselves. They didn't actually use, they didn't actually use the stolen information except to when it was confirmed. So yeah, I mean, I don't think understand that the secrecy is a mistake. Yeah, we're, I think we're, not letting Jack get an idea of what these materials can do. So he's wasting, they're wasting our time. And we could, if we have, if they actually have material, they need to show it to people like Jack. Yeah, I think the secrecy. People who are experimentalists who can learn about the material and see what it, what is actually going on. And also it's possible that some of the materials are from older versions of these machines. And some of the machines that they're using now are, are way, way more, uh, they're from the farther into the future because you can go from the future to the past. So who knows what generation that the crash, the, the craft that crashed are hardly likely to be their best stuff. Right. And yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I don't know if I, that's just something that I find pretty irritating that they didn't have any scientists. I think if Jack was there, that would have been very refreshing. I'm sure he would have asked a lot of um, very pointed yes, questions. And that's what we need. We need our best scientists to get a look at this and not to be kept away because of their security clearance. Well, Jack has a big mouth. Okay. You know, so what? It's not like somebody else is going to, it's not, it's only going to be scientists who are going to be able to look at this and they won't be able to convert these and reverse engineer them into, you know, machines that can, you know, like we, the reason why we're being so asshole-ish, let's say, is because we're trying to keep our American superiority over everybody else. Yeah, and, we, you know, maybe I the other countries want to do the same thing, but the fact is we're going yeah, to have I mean, to agree to, to let all these scientists get a look at it and, and share the 
because most there is weaponry aspects of this but most of it is going to be not to do with weaponry it's going to have yeah. to do with building materials and healthcare and other things that are are going to change human life for the better yeah not and for the worse and i the think bomb was nothing compared to what this is quantum think, mechanics this new yeah. science is going to be a complete it's going to change everything and I think simultaneously to that, we also need to make sure that people are well informed. You know, like you said, you're also very interested in the moral aspect of aliens as they are. Um, they have you know, morals, and believe me, they stick by them. They stick by them better than we. It's not like you know how human beings, you know, they have moral qualms, but in the final end, they go for the money. That's not okay. them. That's why I think you're never going to hear. You're never going to see a video of a UFO landing on the White House lawn to go talk to Joe Biden. They don't. Give I think a fuck. that they don't yeah, give they, a fuck about Joe Biden. They don't give a fuck about Kim Jong Un. They are getting in touch with people directly because they are. They can. They can understand from a distance what a person's character is, and they are. You know what. One rational sort of, you know, one rat, some ra one rational point that I I hear from some of more my more scientifically minded um, friends that I think is is, you know, somewhat of a um, justifiable point is that you know there's a lot of strategic ambiguity as you know people in the intelligence community would call it around this idea of UFOs and. People think that part they know part of the it's they know they're there. I'm I have no doubt that these people know, but they are keeping it a secret because they don't want anybody else. They're afraid of the Chinese. We're afraid of the Russians. This is this is this kind of stupid shit is going to is keeping the world from being a much better place already because of what we could do if we could see the stuff, but we're not getting to see it because these assholes which is why I think I think what's going to happen is you think some of these assholes are aliens? Do you think some no, of the people no, are I people don't there? no they I, I mean, don't I think no, I think have, that I think to. what I think is that they are going to I think that they're going to overturn the powers that be. I think that I they are so. they are they are not interested in keeping humans enslaved they want us they want to see us free so that they're, they're not going to do anything to help all these assholes they are going to make them irrelevant money will be irrelevant yeah this, but that all comes of this stuff that that has ruled earth for so long that's going to be overturned the earth that is comes, a rich planet yeah, every that single person really on earth should have the money to 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 be able to do what they could do if somebody has the brilliance the innate brilliance to uh to uh, like work on a on a warp drive or to create a you know or do anything you know building revolution we got to stop stop wasting the people like we do with you know by putting them under, you know, making them work crummy jobs and where they're getting paid 15 bucks an hour, you know, and, and being being enslaved and working for these giant companies where some asshole like Bill Gates gets all the money and the rest of us don't have it. No, that's got to end. This yeah. is this is what I, I, I know because of all this time I've shared with them that they are not for this they are against it so they're not looking to see this enslavement continue and they're looking for the right they're, they're, they're working on a plan that's going to yeah. change and, and i think life. and you know one thing i'm very sort of passionate about and, and try to get involved in is sort of distributed systems decentralized systems and i think right. perhaps one of the things that they could be waiting for is sort of the emergence of new governance um, and new governance they systems. They are waiting to see what people will do. They're waiting to see are people going to grow up and over and and overturn these 
top-down hierarchies. They hate them. They don't use them. In for what one of the concepts that I learned from them is the the sacred I. The individual is the important thing, and the group added to that. But every individual, in other words, when they, if you ever saw Superman one, <laughs> yeah, did you ever see it? Yeah, I did. Do you remember how it starts with that meeting where every person on the planet of Kandor is telepathically meeting? They're all there. Every person. There is no representative government. I don't have uh, Sandy Cortez speaking for me and stealing my money and my opportunities so that they can get to get it. No, they're they're all important. Every individual is a crucial part building block of the world. There's not going to be any more of this, you know, we have to we have to give our power to these other people so that they can take our power. No, that's over with. That's we've got to figure out how to replace this. So the fact is that's what's going to happen. We're we're going to have to show that we have grown as a people and as a species so that we don't use this anymore. This, you know, and we're gonna to have to learn this new language, this ability to psychically communicate and, and use the same- Hopefully things like Neuralink can help with that. What? Have you heard of, have you heard of Neuralink? Sort of the brain- Is that Elon computer. Musk's thing? Yeah, the brain computer interface. Hopefully stuff like that can help. Well, I think so. I mean, but we have to watch out because it's not like I trust Elon Musk either. Yeah. I don't. I don't Anyone trust centralized, any centralized you know I, mean? I don't. I'll have to see. You know what I mean? Because there's some things that he's allowed. I mean, you know, I was kicked off LinkedIn in 2015 because I said something about the Chinese. But now I realize... But, but you know, in, in a way, it's like there's so many things that are going on. I you know, there's 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 censorship, there's all this stuff. So I just don't know. You know, I, I, you know, we have to be able to get past where we're censoring people, and the secrecy is insane. These people do not believe in secrecy, they're they don't hide any secrets, they don't. They, that whole concept is completely foreign to them. They don't, they don't have any need for secrecy. They're, they're happy to share what they know with people who are sentient to their degree. But the fact is human beings are not yet up to their degree. That's yeah. one of the problems. And David, what, a question I have for you is what would you say to the rationally minded, very intelligent, you know, and, and as you can imagine, intelligent people tend to be skeptical, but also somewhat open-minded individual um, that would like to get into this, that would like to understand, outside of obviously reading your incredible book uh, that I recommend. Um, well, what would well you say I would like to see people, to be honest, one of the things that I would like to do, well, one of the things that I would like to do is I'd like to get a, whole, a bunch of people to show up someplace where we could get some people who could talk and we could all share the stuff together. I mean, online is great, but let's face it, it's personal contact. We're people. We need we need yeah. personal contact. We need to, yeah. we need to, you know, uh, and and I think that that's the way we can we can we can create like a fire. You know, and it'll it'll exponentially change instead of, you know, that's why they they did this shutdown with COVID. They didn't want this to happen. We have to completely prevent that from ever happening again. That shutdown, as far as I'm concerned, if they ever try a shutdown again, I'm going to the barricades. <laughs> I will never never allow i'm a very good shot i mean if i ever have to i mean i will i will rebel i will not allow anybody to do that to me i did never took a vaccine i knew it was bullshit um 
I had, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are wrong, but I'm not going to have any, listen to anybody. These people who did this are stupid people and I'm not going to listen to them. And it's time for all of us to, uh, to get together and, you know, to, and to, and also to create a curriculum for one of the ideas that I had, which I got from, from the ZT was to, uh, was to start teaching telepathic kids and and to start giving them these advanced courses and start you know teaching them all this stuff and the science and this is what we need to create here on earth is a I'm signing up for this and and, I, and where we know. all and and where that this is all and that we're not and not and not so that we can be on top and enslave everybody else no that we'll have to be connected with this Valis as well. And that Valis will make sure that we are not taking advantage or using it to stuff our own pockets. No, that, that's that got to be over. We cannot be, you know, meet the old boss, same as the new boss. We won't get fooled again. We cannot do that. We have to really be transparent with other people. And we have to be not selfishly doing this we 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 only enrich ourselves together by by you know by one and one makes three maybe or five or ten or a hundred thousand some way yeah. like that instead of the way we've been doing it where all the money is in a few hands this has got to end all yeah, that I stuff i think that's i think that's brilliant and i think it's it's a tremendous value because i know that young people especially people. This is what it's about. It's about young people in the future. So I'm very much in a hurry to, to, to reach out to the young ones because I didn't have this when I was 22 or 12 or two, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. And, you know, I mean, and I'm very concerned that I don't want another generation going, being wasted. It's time that, you know, we go about, you, you know, and one of the things that Oslo is good for is I'm hoping to, if I could figure out a way, if I get enough money, I'm going to, I'm going to create a place where I start inviting like people who like, who are astrologers or, you know, uh, people, because, you know, Hey, I was an astrologer when I was in my twenties because the metaphysics of it makes a lot of sense. And you know what? Yeah. These ETs do believe in a kind of symbolic astrology. They, you know, what they don't believe in, they don't believe in an invisible God that tells everybody what to do, but they do believe in, they have morals and moral values and, you know, and, and, and they're very serious about them. They, you know, but and yet, they believe in laughing. They they laugh. They think things are funny. They, they have cultures. They're not like, you know, these serious, you know, people who, you know, ruin every party. No, they're into, I, I told you, like, I was invited when I, when they allowed me to see them, I, it was at a party where there was, there was champagne and, you know, and uh, you know what I mean? It was like, they're not judgmental that way. But, you know, but they have the, you know, it's, it's completely different than what we might think, but they have these morals and, you know, because the morals are about life and about enabling life and protecting life and, you know, uh, inculcating life, not, not, you know, limiting life and censoring life and everything, you know, people, we've been doing all the wrong things on this planet. And we keep doing it. It's like insane. And so they're saying we we can change and, and it's just, we can just, bad habits, more like our bad habits. It's not like we have to, it's, that it's gonna be that complicated. And so we need to get at people who are young and allow them to, to learn and to communicate and to give them, uh, and, and also, and to know that there's a community of people who are open-minded that are very exactly. rational and, exactly. that are okay, and that are okay with people who are okay with believing and accepting 
new preconceptions of reality. Right. And that means that every single, you know, that, all, you know, it's the content of your character, as Martin Luther King used to say. It's not your skin color that counts. It's all, that's all random. You know, every, it has nothing to do, you know, we, we you know, it's about, you know, the random evolution is, you know, is very, you know, a project, you know, it's a thing that most people don't even understand, but, you know, destiny, personal destiny and, and waking up to what person, a person's destiny is, that's when you 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 leave those categories behind and become conscious and then you're responsible for the content of your consciousness that's a different story totally yeah and what it's talking about is the, the the consciousness and the and and it's not so the craft is not just about getting around and not it's also about being connected to this you know an a, an unlimited intelligence and an, uh, and a moral uh, guide, and you know, it's not just it's not just um, going around and not learning. It's it's learning about what's important in life, and and um, not about you know we need money to to uh, you know money will be is going to become irrelevant. I mean, one of the things that Gene Roddenberry in Star Trek. You know, they didn't really have money. And it's, yeah. it sounds counterintuitive because how can you do without money? But but these people don't have money. They, they don't need money. All the ability that they need, they, they don't need money. And if they, they use money here, I think they can just get it. They, yeah, they, I think they basically... Money, money is, is somewhat of a tool that... I think it's a tool that we have to use here, but you know, and, and in a way it's been used to enslave humanity. That's why, you know, this banking thing in England is very appropriate with Nigel Farage. He got debanked. If you don't have a bank, you're fucked. Yeah. And, and Nigel Farage got debanked and then he's fighting back and it's working. So. And that's an issue. Because that's a form of censorship, right? Um, and yeah, and so it's one, even worse, one, you can't live, Daniel, without a bank. I yeah. mean, you'd starve to death. And they want to change. They want to take away our ability to use cash. I hope somebody comes up with a counterfeit hard currency based on gold. I don't care if it's counterfeit, but it starts spreading it around the planet. Because to be honest, I'm going to. I will stop using my bank, you know. We and I call, we call that Bitcoin. <laughs> but 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 Bitcoin, I don't trust. My nephew oh, yeah. is is a big backer of Bitcoin, but I'll tell you about that because you know, I mean, it's just like I know all these people with money, and yet I have nothing. I mean, you know, I'm living on, I'm living on, on on peanuts, and it's like this this thing with money's got to end. You know, we can't have this where some people have all the money and the rest are fucked. That's got to <laughs> end. The, yeah. You know, we cannot limit people's opportunities because they don't have the money. What if they're, what if they're, they could, you know, brilliant. And if, if Vallis understands this and, and that's why everything, all this stuff is going to change. When they're not there, they know that it's obscene what's happening. You yeah, know, and David, people's lives are being wasted. You know, yeah. because you have a, we're all mortals. Even those people are mortal. They don't live forever. You know, so we can't. You know, we can't waste life. It's it's the, they believe that life is sacred, and it's not just because of a church or a God. You know, God says so. No, it's because life itself. You know, all life. You know, birds, trees all that stuff, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, a, a, you know, one question that I would have for you, um, a final question would be, if, if you had to think of one idea, just one idea that you felt as if was the most valuable idea that someone could learn in this mm -hmm. moment in time, what would that idea be? 
that consciousness is everywhere. Maybe. I mean that and that that it doesn't exist just between our earlobes. And that, you know, that that, you know, even octopuses and jellyfish have a consciousness. They have that non-distributed, you know. I mean, you know, it's different. So we have to start looking at life in, with new ways and we have to start realizing we have to we have to uh, do everything we can to allow people to get at the information they need and to give people the tools they need to do what they can do to contribute to this uh, a better world. It's not going to happen if we don't, you know, I mean, and we'll need to uh, change our, our systems of governance. There's no question. The individual, the, the, the sacred individual, the I, the I of the individual, you know, and, and, and all of those people getting together, we can no longer look at them and say, oh, they're just the masses, you know, they're just the peanuts. No, they, they every person is super important, every single person. And we can't limit them anymore. That's gonna, that's all gonna have to change. And I think that this, this revolution that's, yes, it's focused now on spacecraft and all that, but consciousness is part of it. Yeah. If you talk to Jack, you'll see that consciousness is the same. ER equals EPR is about the back reaction. There's actually, there's, you know, if like, the you you know the the electron you know affects the field the field affects back onto the electron and here we are a quantum large scale quantum object you me we're all these large scale quantum objects so we're yeah. looking at them and our brain is a soup is a worm a, a room temperature superconducting quantum uh device measuring device and that's how the brain works it's not that the consciousness is here the consciousness is everywhere there's nothing that isn't consciousness it's the beable you know what's dead is what's not conscious the the living materials that we start to create will have consciousness everywhere and then and then we'll we'll have a completely different world that we won't be making our, our homes out of metal and wood anymore. We'll be making them out of these new, new ones. So, yeah, and, and, and with, you know, and with that, I'd like to say, David, I've had perhaps one of the most enlightening conversations. Um, me too. I, me I've, too. I mean, I've, I got I've, as much out of this as you, because I got the same. Yeah. And I just, hey, I, can, is there any way I could get this video? Oh, absolutely. I, I will send it to you personally, and I will also put it up. Um, do, do you have my email? I do. I do. Oh, okay, I great. great. Um, yeah, I wanted to learn a lot about you as an individual, and so I've I really enjoyed this, and I think you're you're a remarkable person. Um, hopefully, a person that I hope to speak much more to because I feel as if there's. A oh lot yeah, yeah. Look, I'm, do you where do you where do you live? By the way, I'm down here in Boston. I live in Somerville, Act. In Somerville, you mean you live near Tufts? Uh, yeah, well, I live well, near Tufts. I, yeah. Somerville is just a short walk from Central Square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's long by train. You live on Mass Ave. Yeah. Huh? Oh, you okay. said on Mass Well, I lived a block and a half from that from Central Square subway stop on yeah, Fitch so Street. I'm like maybe a 15 minute walk from Central Square. That's amazing. Okay, That's awesome. I know exactly. I used to go to the Coop, and I spent time at the Harvard Library. You know what I mean? Looking at the Gutenberg book. I should show. Yeah, you. it's. I'm a photographer, so I have to show you my pictures. I'll I'll send you some pictures of Norway and stuff because it's beautiful. I'd love, but please, I'll send you my picture okay. of me and Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, some I'll of the rock and roll people. I'll use that as the um, as the picture for this, but but I would like to say, David, before I end the end the recording, um, I'm so grateful that you decided to take your time out of, to take time out of your day today to join me. Um, well, I felt I, feel I should. I immediately thought, or something said, 
you want to do this. So it was how I met Jack. So when I get that, I do it. I don't even question it. I just do it. Because very I don't, you never know where it's going to come from. And the fact is, I miss Boston. We I mean, we I love Boston. Back. I mean, I lived there. I mean, I, you know, it was a big deal to me. That was the first place I went when I was 19. You know, it's like, and my brother lived there. And, you know, we used to, you know, it was for me, I'm living here in Sweden. But, uh, oh, can you, uh, can you? Let me tell you something, but turn off the recording. Yeah, I, yeah. So I'm about to do that. But anyways, I just want to say thank you again. I appreciate you coming on. Um, I'm very grateful that you decided to take time of your day. There's this authenticity to you, a realness to you that I think I've, you know, that's it, very rare these days um, amongst people. And, and it comes off very strongly. And uh, I do want to appreciate you again for coming on. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you.